I guess I'm looking, I'm working on an enterprise startup in the ML space. I mean, I mean leveraging so, ML and AI, sorry. Oh, sorry. Awesome. So Rajat, if I have your permission, I'm going to start recording this. Sure. Okay, let me just uh, set it up properly so it come out a uh, little decent. I'll do a speaker view so you know people can see you on a bigger screen for the recording. Uh, we will get it edited. So first of all, Rajat, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. I'm so glad that uh, we, you found time for us. Uh, this is for our audience. We have Rajat with us and we just found out uh, that he's no longer with Google. Rajat was leading uh, TensorFlow and which he did it for several, several years. He was really instrumental in that. He has created some very interesting uh, opportunities for Google and a lot of IITians. If, for some of you, if you don't know, TensorFlow is part of literally every single AI system out there. Rajat, why don't you talk about yourself a little bit, uh, what you are working on and what is the big thing for you? Sure. Th thanks. First, thanks, Sanjeev. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk to many of you and tell, tell you about all of this stuff. So I had a great run you know, at Google as Sanjeev is really running TensorFlow there, where TensorFlow has become a part, key part of a lot of AI things that people are building. You know, people have been able to do amazing things with TensorFlow. I'm really uh, glad that I had the opportunity to, to be there and be a key part of it. One of the key things over the last few years I've seen is, you know, we've seen huge progress with machine learning and AI, and we're seeing lots of folks use it in interesting ways, especially in the bigger companies like Google and, uh, you know, many of the other big companies as well. Where I saw a gap was machine learning being leveraged to do interesting things on the business side. It was still pretty hard for typical corporations, typical enterprise companies to pick it up and do things. And so, uh, you know, I left Google recently to work in that space and see how we can make a difference in leveraging these technologies to really uh, change how certain things are done on the enterprise side. Rajat. AI is pretty much used literally everywhere now. In fact, uh, I tried that uh, vacuum cleaner which runs by itself and uh, it uses AI. Uh, I remember seeing the presentation a few years ago that it is to the extent that they are mapping everybody's house and they are even talking to companies like Google. And now Google even knows how every single corner in my house looks like. <laughs> which is a very interesting example, but on the same note, Rajat, uh, uh, people are using, and even Google is extensively using uh, uh, AI for uh, listening to people. What I mean by listening to people is really understanding the context and providing them better results. So where it is going, where do you see really the future of AI? Or the areas where we don't know about it and it is being leveraged? Yeah. So. I, I think there's a, enough hype about AI that you often hear about a lot of these things, sometimes before they are real in some sense. <laughs> uh, for example, you know, one of the areas where, not to say that it's not used, we've been hearing about self-driving cars for a long time. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's been a huge progress from you know, the decade ago that, that we started hearing about these, but we're not quite there. Uh, I know we hear companies claiming that it's right around the corner. I think we're getting close, but uh, at least the self-driving cars as we think of them are probably going to take a few more years. That said, that same kind of technology is in use in the, you know, in the very simplest form in the, the robot in your home that's doing the cleaning. Of course, much simpler that, you know, than that in the home at this point, but even simpler uh, you know, things outside like deliveries and so on. Now that's sort of the, the common things that we look at. There are lots and lots of other areas that we don't see that happen, you know, in areas like, of course, you know, we talk about healthcare, where AI is helping, you know, not just generally, but in the current crisis, for example, COVID-19, you know, there are companies that have built uh, ways to actually help identify that somebody has a disease based on X, chest X-rays and things like that. Uh, and there are lots of other, you know, of course, image-based techniques that are being used and radiology and other areas as well. But other than that, there's been 
as well, and we continue to see progress on that side. So that's healthcare itself. In terms of, uh, you know, if you think about bigger challenges that we face as a society, as uh, humans, there are lots of these grand challenges where we've made a ton of progress because of machine learning, because of AI. Uh, if you think about things like, you know, weather prediction, climate change, et cetera, that we talk about uh, from a scientific perspective, there's, in some cases, we already seen impact from AI because people can use these fancier, the better models to make better predictions, better, edu more educated guesses on where things are going and sort of go from there. In mm -hmm. other cases, we continue to see those improvements over the next several years. Uh, coming closer to, you know, where we are, I think we'll continue to see AI being used more and more in the products we use, in the products our companies that we work for use as well. In both of these, I think, are still early days. There are some of the early examples of products that we've seen from companies like Google, of course, are, say, Google Photos, which is very obvious, right? It just figures out what, what are there in the pictures for you. Uh, you talked about the assist, Google Assistant and Alexa and all of these other assistants that are listening and, and understanding you. That's still very early. There's a long way to go in terms of from where we are to really truly conversational or truly understanding what we mean when we say this. Uh, it's, it kind of works for the basic things and it's great. It's a huge improvement over where things were just a couple of years ago, but I expect to see a lot more progress over the last, next few years. Sorry. On that, I have a question, Raja. So last year, uh, I believe at a Google conference, uh, the CEO of Google came and he talks about, you talk to your phone and it will make an appointment for you at your hairdresser or to uh, car mechanic to all of those, right? Uh, technologically, it seems pretty straightforward to me today, but I haven't really seen a great adoption of it even today. So what is really holding uh, such innovation back? That's one. Second is, that's interesting. Where I really see the challenges, uh, we talk about a lot of these simpler applications which make life a little easier, but when we talk about a health, I haven't seen any major global level collaboration where I can have, like for example, a system that every single X-ray is available and we are training these models. So where is it going? Because you have worked a lot in the healthcare space. So I'd love to hear your views on both. Yeah, so, so the first one itself, you know, you mentioned it, you know, the, a very specific example of an app that hasn't quite taken, uh, taken off really in some sense the way you would like. And, and that's where I think the difference is between assistant solving like specific answers, like questions to uh, set a reminder or play a specific song, et cetera, versus a slightly more complex thing like the appointment setting that you were saying, because often there are a few it's an entire conversation you need to have to do that appointment. If you're doing it online, then you are going through a conversation and you're taking action yourself. When you ask an assistant to do that, they often just little things like that. You might ask for nine o'clock, maybe nine o'clock is not available. Do you want the next day or like an hour later? And just these little things like that, conversationally, these assistants, these machine learning models are not quite there yet. They're getting, they're improving very, very rapidly. Over just the last two years, three years, we've seen huge improvements in natural language processing and expect those to start rolling out in this area in the next couple of years and, and are seeing advantages from them. Uh, going to the healthcare example that you're talking about, I think healthcare is, uh, is seeing progress, but it's not quite there. On the research side, I think there's been a lot of progress where we see early models which uh, actually have great potential that are showing like, okay, we talked about chest x-rays, there are things where you take a picture of the back of the eye and understand a lot of things from them. And basically, wherever the modality is a picture and you're trying to understand things, if you have enough data, we've seen that these models can perform, can outperform even the best humans, you know, or, or even the best doctors or the specialists in those fields typically. Uh, but that's a very narrow modality and so on. Now we've seen that doing really well in our tests and the data sets that we've seen in research. It's not always translated to real world impact yet for a number of reasons. One, in the medicine area and the healthcare area, you wanna be super careful in what you deploy. The bar for being right is very, very high. 
And it's the same kind of, you know, the, in the US we have FDA approvals for a good reason, right? You, you have new medicine, you have new techniques, you want to go through a process before you let them be for, for whatever. And some of these techniques are actually going through those processes across the companies. In some very, very specific areas, uh, like I was mentioning COVID-19 chest x-rays or whatever, some of these have accelerated and actually been deployed now, but it's still small. <laughs> the, the other uh, hard part about healthcare is just privacy. So when you talk about a common uh, database across the world, let's say with all of these different things coming together and somebody training models on it, uh, the risk from a privacy perspective is fairly high. So it's really important to manage that well and make sure that the right people have access to the right kind of data and that's not, uh, doesn't go off based on what you're trying to do. Got it, got it. great. So uh, that, that is a really interesting. So. Coming back to the AI, uh, since you have spent uh, more than a decade, I believe in AI, right? Personally? Uh, well, well, almost the last eight, nine years, I guess. Eight, yeah. nine years, yeah. Well, AI is technically not that old that way. But <laughs> we are doing AI for the last 50 years, in my opinion. The first calculator right. was AI. It depends how we describe AI. If the machine is doing something to me is artificial intelligence. So, is this today, if I look at it, and uh, I am uh, personally in the AI space and uh, I go and preach uh, uh, large brands, how to use AI and solve their problems? Uh, how can they really find some interesting data point which can solve that interesting problem? And one example I can give you is, uh, we are saying is, uh, since we are in working with the CPG companies that you can take a picture of the menu, any restaurant you go, you take a picture, we analyze it and we tell you what brands are there, if your product is there or not, and if your product is not there, what product you should present to uh, your uh, uh, that restaurant or that uh, organization, and how you should present it. It's not just what, how you should present it, all that, and we are leveraging a lot of things, of course, OS, OCR, NLP, AI, a lot of predictive analytics around it. So the challenge I see, the biggest challenge I see it is, uh, the data set is missing in this scenario, and that's the biggest problem we are seeing it. Don't you feel, I believe in healthcare is the same problem. We don't have enough data to accurately predict when we talk about the bars are high, it is about the quality of the, not, I don't think, it's not just the quality, it's the quantity of data too. Or is it the quantity is there, but the noise is there, so you're not able to find the right results. What is really the problem when it comes to healthcare? And specifically, let's talk about just x-rays yeah in a very narrow problem like that i would say like x-rays i don't think it's a data limitation I, there are again not everybody has access to all the data but there are lots of hospitals across us or other countries that have tons of x-rays and they're good enough i mean i would say they have enough numbers for us to really learn from them on the you know it, it, along with that, there have been lots of improvements in terms of being able to leverage learnings from other data sets and applying these so we can actually train with smaller data sets. We don't need as large data sets as we used to need just a few years ago again. And so if you take a very narrow case saying, let's say you have x-rays of a certain kind and you're trying to record or trying to identify diagnose one specific thing, one specific disease or something like that, mm -hmm. I think these models can do really, really well now. Now, okay, let's say the model makes a prediction. How are you going to use it though? Right. There's a, if you think about how a doctor takes that decision, let's just take a, let's say a chest x-ray. It says, okay, there's a prediction that it's a pneumonia, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. Now, some doctor still has to take that and decide what are they going to prescribe? What are they going to do with it? Or if it says not pneumonia, what are they going to do? Are they going to look at the x-ray again? How right. does it fit into their cycle? All of that. And there's just a lot of other process that goes into, goes into uh, making all of that successful and mm -hmm. work well that, that is still being worked out. Uh, you know, the other things with, the other issue with things like healthcare again is how do you manage the, uh, the problems where, you, where they come up? So you're not gonna get it 
right 100% of the time. In that sense, AI is, these machine learning models are no different than humans. We're not 100% right either. Uh, but how do you manage that, right? How do you manage that risk? What does that mean? So I think there are lots of questions there that people are still figuring out. There's a little bit more, uh, you know, questions around, okay, these models are too black box where people don't understand. They made a decision. I don't understand where that came from. Can I really trust it? How do we build that trust? Mm -hmm. And again, from a technology perspective, there's been a lot of work, but to bring that into the systems, to bring that to the people, there's still uh, another layer of, you know, the application building, the right kind of things that need to go in to make that happen. So when you said trust, now trust is a, you know, very complex word as you and me both know what trust really means. And uh, I have seen several companies raised almost billion dollar till date, and they leveraged AI for fraud detection, especially in the financial space. And banks were writing checks to them left and right. And interestingly enough, majority of those companies just disappeared. To my utter surprise, uh, either maybe absorb or people have developed those technologies. So, so point I'm trying to make it is let's bring it to today's scenario. We have pandemic situation at our hand. Uh, the whole world is trying to solve the problem of C-19. And the biggest challenge, what I see is they are talking about it is, first of all, I haven't seen that level of global collaboration in my life. And I believe uh, even our previous generation has never seen that level of collaboration where companies like uh, uh, largest pharma companies are willing to share their formulation day one, the whole world is behind them, FDA wants to approve it quickly. All of those things are happening. However, I still kind of feel like uh, the global collaboration philosophically seems to be happening, but it's not really happening. And let me tell you why I believe that's not happening. The data from the grassroots level, is it being really collated with the uh, symptoms as well as the treatment given to them at one place. So it is available to every single pharma company or any organization who wants to do something about it. So for example, if you look at uh, last four years and we are seeing a lot of conflicting news, right? information is very conflicting. Oh, take zinc, take this, take that, don't do this. Uh, initially, we were talking about malaria drugs to solve this problem. Then we said there's a problem with the breathing problem. Then we were spending money on hundred other things and we realized it has some relevance, but not a lot. So don't you think there is a need to create a global fabric for research today, specifically when it come to healthcare? So the whole world come together, all the health organization come together, create a system where you anonymize the patient data, but you still have relevant data available. So the organization can do the research and this data is available Either paid or free doesn't matter. There's a secondary issue, but it is available to everyone. And then yes, indeed, uh, engineers indeed. like us can get involved and solve some of these issues. Puneet, you have a point here, I guess. Yes, and it's a very good point that Sanjeev, you bring up where uh, we look looking at collaboration worldwide, but then also you hear about an arms race in artificial intelligence where uh, the United States is kind of paranoid that China is taking uh, taking over uh, the the world in AI. So how how does it how does it work when when nations are are not talking to each other in the same language in in AI and kind of are paranoid about it? Well, and that's the question for Trump, man, not for me. You're asking the wrong question. We are technologists, <laughs> right, Rajat? We want to solve the problem. We don't want to solve the problem of yeah, how people do it. Policies. Yeah. Policies. I, I think they, and Puneet has a good point there. I, I think that some of these problems go hand in hand. You can't separate technology from the societal changes and stuff. And for us to think that we can just solve everything with we are just pure technology as us being naive. Um, and so I, I, I think those are, you know, the, the things that both of you bring up are valid. That, that said, if you think about a your global database with uh, you know everybody doing the right thing because it's good for the world. That doesn't happen. I mean, they, for, forget the world. Think Come on, man! Do Please don't say that, Rajat. I expect better yeah, from no, you. You are no, Google. It, it, it's not about Google. It's not the most. It's usually not the most efficient way of doing things. Okay. So 
If you think about markets and the, the reason we, you know, most of us here, especially in the US or, or across a large part of the world today, believes in capitalism is that it works in lots of ways. There, there are, I mean, that said, the, the ways we've done capitalism and the ways we implement it aren't always great. And we see different kinds of issues and uh, lots of variation between the haves and the have nots and stuff. And they, those are real problems to be, to be thought through. Uh, but but at its core, the fact that you have a free economy where people are trying to do things that make sense, that help them eventually help everybody else in the economy as well. And if you believe those core tenets, then trying to say, no, we're going to put this extra structure, more government-like, forget, like not just within the US and but across the world, is in some ways just fooling ourselves that we'll make that work. I mean, we've seen that fail in so many different ways. Should we try it? I, I think there are things we should try. I mean, there are international organizations, whether you take United Nations or who or <clears throat> in different areas that are doing good work and it's important for them to be there supported by all of these pieces. And, and there is a certain level of sharing that's important that's across the world. We are seeing some of that sharing already, right? We are seeing, uh, especially in the talked about COVID-19 case, a lot of groups are coming together and sharing whatever data they have about the patients. A lot of countries are doing that. A lot of hospitals are doing that. And so putting more of that together uh, that makes sense from them is, is helpful. There's going to be some help and some thought that the governments need to put in that help align those uh, totally. Uh, but to a large extent, they also have to make sense economically to these different players in the game. And that's just going to lead to much better results, basically. Uh, yeah, going back to you know the, 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 the paranoia around, say, US versus China or, or other countries as well. You know, uh, <clears throat> I think there are a few different things at play there. One, of course, is the, OK, is this sort of a, you know, if somebody gets access to the best AI, are they going to be the winner and winner take all kind of thing? That's sort of one side of it. Another side of it is the privacy implications of data from within those countries sort of leaks out to others, et cetera. And they're, they're both are being done at different levels. On the privacy side, each region, you know, US has its own laws today. In fact, California has its own laws. Europe's created some laws. China has some laws. India's creating some laws over the last few years as well. And, and we'll continue to see that play and people iterate on different areas iterate on that until we get to something better. On the technology side, hopefully for the privacy stuff, we can make progress on technologies that allow us to leverage that data without losing the privacy elements. I mean, there's some work on that with differential privacy, federated learning, et cetera. But I would say it's still very, very early. So that's that's the one side. On the paranoia that AI, the winner of AI will take the winner take all kind of thing. It's still, I mean, where we are, it seems even if we get to you know AGI, which most people even in the field don't believe we are anywhere close to, we are still far away from a point where uh, that kind of a scenario is possible. So yes, there is paranoia, but I don't think there's enough basis for that paranoia. Uh, that said, it is important for each country, including the US, to invest in this. It's one of the key technologies. And it's not just about, unlike the arms race, this technology is not just about helping build those arms, right? It's actually going to have a huge impact on what we're doing in the societies, uh, you know, whatever country is ahead. So for example, Google's done really well from a research perspective, and it shows in the products that Google has. Similarly, the countries and the regions that uh, stay ahead in this game, it'll benefit those regions in lots of different ways. It's not just about arms race. It'll hopefully, uh, you know, people continue to do it in the open. For example, the research that we've seen over the last 10 years, at least 99% of the research in this field has been completely in the open. And I would say that has made a huge difference in just accelerating and having these, these things go much faster. If all of the, these had been closed, each done in silos where each one was trying to do their own thing, we would probably still be like in where we were in 2013 or 2014. So that pace of innovation is hugely because we're doing these things in the open. So it's important to keep that openness and really leverage that. Well, yes, being mindful of how do we all benefit from this in different ways. 
So what do you see as a future of TensorFlow? Uh, and the reason I'm asking this question is uh, almost every single company and every single time we have talked about AI, uh, at least in my closed network, from NVIDIA to Amazon to everyone, they are talking about TensorFlow. And you were uh, in the helm of uh, TensorFlow. You led the team for a long time. Uh, it won't be uh, wrong to say that you are one of the key architect of that. So where do you see the TensorFlow is going and what you see as a future? So, so if you think about, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll step back and talk about say programming, right? We started programming computers since the early days of computers basically, and it's been what, 50 years, actually a lot more now. Um, and and um, like the, all this time, so, sorry, yeah. I'm saying seems like yesterday. <laughs> that's that's right. It does seem like yesterday, uh, and I forget how old I'm getting. <laughs> still, still early, still a long way to go. Hopefully, the healthcare improvements and all of that keep us healthy for a long time. Uh, but but thinking about you know programming and thinking about all the devices we have around us, the the way I see it, and you know, machine learning is sort of been likened to software 2.0 or whatever or 3.0 or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the, the basic idea with programming has been that we tell computers exactly what to do. And the way I see machine learning is, it's really the same kind of thing, except instead of telling them what to do by specifying rules, what we are saying is we're teaching them by doing or showing them a lot of examples. Right? And so if you think about it that way, now over time, more and more of the programming that we have is gonna be replaced by learned models in some sense. And not, not everything, there's still room for the traditional programming where you want very specific rules and there's, there's clearly value in that. But wherever things get more tricky where you have to put out 10 different rules and things are more fuzzy, and there are lots and lots of examples, right? Of course, wherever you think about images or text, et cetera, which are not as precise as just numbers, mm -hmm. uh, but even where, where there are numbers when the precision is not quite the same way, there's some fuzziness, then we want machine learning. And so if you think about every place where you have programming today, where you have some programs that are running, every single device that you have that, in the future, I expect machine learning to be running on those. So software, you know, software like TensorFlow, they expect it to be running not just in the data centers, on the phones, of course, it's running on the workstations on the machines that we're talking through right now. In fact, you know, if we're talking through Zoom, Zoom has all these models to, uh, you know, to cut out to have a fake background and virtual background and all of that. Things like that can use machine learning if they're not already, and they, they can do a great job with that, right? So uh, the, these are gonna be everywhere. We have things running on really, really tiny devices on, on microcontrollers, you know, which don't even have a full-fledged OS, and so to speak, or it's just a real-time operating system. And so we'll see machine learning really spread through every single thing that we're doing, and we won't think it, of it as a separate piece, right? It's just part of the software. Just, just like we think of software, that's how we should think of machine learning in the future. So, so uh, Rajat, I have a question for you. So it looks like it's a mammoth task to to develop a AI system in your company, be your your banking, your your bank or your insurance stuff like that. Uh, do do these companies that are at the helm of it right now, let's say, not using AI, be dinosaurs in 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 ten years, where all these fintech companies take over uh, these these banks? And I'll give you one example where, say, Ant Financial is is uh, giving loans in five minutes using AI, uh, just going through people's uh, background very quickly and, and they know exactly how much loan to give at what rate to give. How can any company that's not, that does not have the technology compete with such companies say a few years from now? So, so the, the question is from the companies that are not using AI, should they be paranoid that they'll be replaced completely by such companies? Like uh, a deluge of AI comes in and what and, are you talking to me? Humans are getting replaced with AI. This we are not talking about companies here, we're talking about humans. Sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the, I, bo both are actually very, very relevant and important, right? The, the if you think about companies, and in fact, there was a start I was reading recently where a while back was it 10 years ago? I think the if you looked at the, the last decade or a decade old fortune 500 or fortune 50 or fortune 100 companies, the ones that stayed up there has been changing very rapidly. It used to be like, if you look at a decade, 
a large fraction of the companies were still there in the top 10 or the top 100 or the top 500. And now that number is changing a lot more frequently. And that's been driven by the pace of change. You know, primarily technology is the driver. Of course, with machine learning, with AI, we are seeing that pace of change accelerate. Right? We are seeing a lot more change quickly. So do we expect things like that to happen? Absolutely. If, the, if companies uh, don't really latch on and pick up these technologies themselves, over time, they'll become dinosaurs and die off in time. Now that's so it. What? Is that the death knell for every company? Is that the death knell for every company? I don't think so. I mean, there, there's definitely room for new players to come in with every new technological wave. There's new things that you that are possible, and, and some of those will be amazingly successful, right? Uh, a few decades ago, we have seen companies like Google and Facebook, and each of these come up because of different trends, different things that that came up around those times. That said, for existing companies, they have something that new companies don't. They have real customers. They have real money that they're making from that. And so if they can leverage technology in a good way, if they can change fast, they still have a good run at it. Uh, it's not that easy to just displace somebody just because you have the technology. That's only one part of the person. They, they looks like they will have to piggyback on companies like Google to, to stay ahead in the race because it seems like a very difficult task for, for companies that are not in tech to be uh, ahead in AI. So this is where you see it going that they partner with such companies and, and then go ahead. I, I think it's going to be a mix. So, so there's a, if you think about there'll be many layers in the stack. So starting with SickCloud, does it make sense for every company to build their own data center now? Typically, no. I mean, there's a, it, the, not just because of the cost of running that data center, maybe at scale, you can actually do that cheaply. But because of all the technologies that are available only in public clouds today, anything that you want to build there will be way more expensive for you now. So, so just the overall cost add up. And so as you go up the stack, though, there are places where these companies need to differentiate. If all they're doing is just taking these things and running them, yes, they, it's better than not doing it at all. But if they truly think about it and how they can integrate it, they can do a much better job. That, that said, I mean, that is definitely easier said than done for a lot of these large companies. Hey, and it's you know big, partly because there's just so much legacy there that they have to go through, so much that they have to manage. It's not like they can start from scratch every few years and say, okay, there's this new tech, let's throw everything out and start from this. That yeah. just is not possible. Yeah, value um, creation is a challenge. Yeah, hey, and I, I would say one thing I did want to touch upon like that Sanjeev mentioned earlier, it's not just about the companies, it's about people too. Uh, we are starting, we are seeing a lot of the skills that, you know, traditionally, if you think about the whole offshoring process, not just for software, but a lot of other things, whether it's call centers, whether it's, you know, other little things that are being done offshore or in back offices, we'll see more and more of those being automated over time. And you know what maybe was 50% automated earlier and then you needed people to do everything else will now be maybe 90% or 99% over time, right? And so that'll really have a big impact on the people there. In fact, that's offshoring. If you talk about self-driving cars, again, you know, the self-driving cars, let's say they take a few more years. There are more specific things like uh, deliveries, you know, which are much, at least parts of those are much more easier to automate and we expect to see them sooner, you know, definitely in the next, in this decade in different ways. And those have huge jobs. If you think about truck drivers, that's about 10% of the jobs in the US today. And so, you know, changing that will have a huge impact on the economy and how people need to reskill themselves. How do they need to think about it? And that's probably one of the biggest challenges we face ahead of us that we need to think, of, think hard about. So Rajat, uh, uh, we have a few more minutes. So a few things I want to talk about, which are uh, continuously bothering and are bothering our audience too, and people are asking these questions. And I'm not going to go what Elon Musk is talking about, uh, the future of AI and how the world is and machines are going to run the world, but very, very fundamental thing. So when we talk about automating uh, appointment and all, you and me both know several tasks can be completely automated and it will be automated very quickly. In fact, I have a friend, he has actually, he's into call center business and they make almost $2 billion with this call center operation. The whole business is ready for disruption. 
I have another friend of mine, actually, I'll be talking to their CIO tomorrow, is uh, they have almost $800 million revenues and they provide the infrastructure to these uh, uh, call center or support companies, software technologies. So there is a lot of evolution happening. These are the things going to happen and it's going to change. Is, is our future going to be like the movie Ready Player One or different? I don't know. I'm not the person who knows I will be here or not by that time. But the question I have it is, let's talk about something very, very fun, simple. And uh, Amazon recently got uh, some certification to deliver products through drones. Now, in my head, I'm just thinking that if the drone start delivering and bringing things to our home, then we completely eliminate millions and millions of people in the logistics operation involved. Yeah. At the same time, when we talk about self-driven car, I'm mixing it a little bit. Self-driven car, I, I, am, I am in that industry since 97. I'm talking about that since 97, maybe way before all of you guys. I was in Singapore, designed the first vehicle location system of Asia. And the challenge was always is infrastructure is not there because we could do that in 98, 99, technologically, because the same thing, right? GPS was there when you know GPS, you know the road, you can pretty much build the whole thing, but the infrastructure wasn't there. I personally think we are trying to solve this problem different. I think the problem should be solved by rethinking the future of city, future of civilization, that how do we do settlement? Because there are a lot of things intertwined here. Earlier, we used to build cities next to water. That was the first thing. All the early settlers, all the early cities are around the water because if you have the water, you have life. And then we start building city, middle of nowhere, and then we start bringing electricity there. And so huge challenge with the solar, that problem goes away. We are already talking about zero carbon footprint. We are already talking about building things or cities where it's a carbon neutral when we talk about food and other things. But in reality, what we are really looking at the humanity is how do we create a carbon neutral world if it can't be negative? Because there is a huge problem we have of pollution, sustainability, all of that. So where do you see uh, the future is? How do you see the future and how AI is going to solve that? And I really would like you to give one challenge to all of our IITNs and audience so they start thinking about it and they start trying to solve that problem. Hey, give, give me one second, sorry. So Puneet, while uh, Rajat is working, ah, oh, he's back, right? He's back. Hey, uh, sorry, yes, the future, or, you know, the challenges and some of the things that we're doing, I guess, and how no do we worries. think about it? You're running a startup, I understand. So really the question, Rajat, I have for you, I'm going to rephrase my question. Is there a challenge you have for our audience, uh, mostly engineers, and uh, quite a few maybe from IIT? One, and second is, can you share a story of your life that how you got here from where you was 20 years ago, 25 years ago? Sure. Let, let me start with the first one in terms of um, just challenges uh, and the kind of things that you see. You know, the examples that you gave about how we have built cities uh, traditionally versus now has changed a lot. And there are definitely, um, areas in ways where we should rethink this from the ground up. That said, it's very hard, you know, just like you can't necessarily change an existing company, you know, sometimes you replace it and a new one comes up and the old one dies. You'll probably see some of this in how we built our cities and how we built new things as well. And some of the things will be very new, which, which is just hard to do in the existing system. So can we take San Francisco and really rebuild it from the ground up today? Probably not. I mean, there are just too many constraints that we have to live with and work with. Uh, 
the the good thing about you know people are we are very innovative in terms of coming up with new kinds of things. You know, you mentioned uh, drones earlier in terms of delivery, etc., in self-driving cars. Interestingly, you know, given where we are and some of the challenges we are seeing with self-driving cars, uh, one of the things I'm starting to see that seems very promising to me personally is just flying cars, for example, right? I mean, there's, uh, from a technology perspective, it combines the, the two things that you just talked about. And uh, it, it has different challenges, not the same ones that you see with self-driving cars, but a lot of the things, the issues that you see with self-driving cars are just not there because you're not limited to the infrastructure that you were talking about, right? Of course, in places like China, you're seeing where they're making special roads for just self-driving cars. And we'll, we'll see a mix of these and we'll see some of those go forward. And, and so thinking about, you know, that again, that's just one example, something I uh, really like and enjoy. And I like to think about some of these things sometimes. Okay, well, how can we change these things? Right? Uh, one of the things I would say to folks out there, you know, engineers and others who are listening to this or who think about this is technology is one part or that solves things that can really make huge changes in the world, but it doesn't solve everything. You know, it's about if you think about okay, I have this technology, I'm going to change everything because I have this technology. That's not necessarily the right way to start with. Uh, often it is thinking about what's the problem you're trying to solve. And in this case, you know, if you talk about going from point A to point B, that can be solved with many different things, right? If it's if you want to transport people, then it's self-driving cars or say flying cars or whatever. If it's delivering packages, which are still done through those same vehicles today, it's then you know drones are a valid thing as well and are a reasonable option as well and something that might play out as well. It, it's sort of like saying you know from an uh, innovator's perspective or asking the people perspective, it's not like we want faster horses. It's we, we want to get from point A to point B and what's the best way to do that and that's how we solve it. So, so really uh, think about whatever you're trying to do, you know, technology is definitely, we can do some amazing things with technology, but that's not the starting point. The starting point should be the people, the problems and the problems that we face on this world. And there are some really amazing challenges ahead of us. Uh, some good, some not so good. You know, one of the big ones is of course, climate change. There are lots of proposals to make changes in there uh, to help from a technology perspective and there are others from a people perspective. At the end of the day, I think we, we can combine those two to hopefully have uh, you know, much broader impact. And uh, if I think of the problems, climate change is probably one of the biggest one facing us over the next few decades. And so if we can think of ways, innovative ways to really improve that in different ways with all kinds of technologies, uh, it's not just about software or just about AI. You know, you want uh, alternative ways of generating energy. And we've made tons of progress on those, right? Uh, there's, again, how do you deliver those in these different things? How do you cut the cost down? How do you get water to many more people who don't have access to water? I, I recently read about this project which uh, deployed this totally fully solar-based uh, project which converted basically desalination plant that they could deploy in uh, some part of Kenya. And that brings water to thousands of folks that just did not have access to clean water at that point, right? And so once you deploy it, I mean, there's some cost. If you can bring this down, you can have access to water to so many other people. Uh, so th these are some problems, some challenges that I would like folks to think about and really will make a difference to what we're doing in this world. Uh, go going back to you know how I ended up here, uh, you know, personally, I had a, you know, great time at IIT. I was at IIT Delhi a long time ago. It's been 25 years now. And uh, the, you know, I've personally always enjoyed doing things that I was excited about, that I was curious about, that I wanted to know something new, that, that I learned something from. And I did that at IIT as well. I did that in school as well. Uh, of course, there, there, there are a lot of other things that go in there, of course. You know, my focus was okay, I enjoy this, let me do this, let me focus on this, often to the detriment of ignoring everything else, and which isn't always a good thing that I learned over time. But that did help me in terms of, you know, I changed and tried out lots of different things. Within the software space, I guess that that's something I was excited about and I stayed in. Uh, but I switched jobs, I went to startups, built all kinds of things, and really continued to learn throughout the, throughout my career and still do. They're always 
new things that are I am doing today. Uh, you know, one thing that there's this whole idea of explore and exploit in machine learning, uh, or you know, certain kinds of problems where the idea is you want to leverage your strengths to some extent, right? So you're exploiting everything you know, and you le leverage those, and so you deliver value from those. But you want to continue the exploration, so you're not stuck in that minimum of whatever you know. And so that is really important as well. That combination of learning and uh, leveraging your strengths is, is really important. If you can continue to do that well, that's great. Especially folks early in their career, exploration is way more important. The learning is way more important. I, that said, I don't think the, the value of learning goes away. You have to keep at it forever. We're gonna be living fairly long lives. And learning to me is what keeps me going because there's always something new to do. There's always something new. New challenges. New challenges. Yes. So uh, what I'm hearing from you, Rajat, is uh, curiosity played a major role in your life. Uh, even in your IIT days, you were a very curious person. And uh, I'm constantly hearing that from all the speakers I've spoken to in the past, that uh, they are here just because they were curious, because all of us went to school and did different things. I was in applied mechanics and uh, now I'm in the software. Puneet was in a very different kind of a discipline and he's here. Uh, so as uh, you, you were doing different things, I'm assuming, even if you, I believe you are in the, you were in computers. I, I was in double E. So I did some computers there, but hardware as well. So seeing right. how things are built from this ground up, yeah. So, uh, we have, so really, is there any key message you have for our audience, which uh, you believe will inspire them and will give them some insight into your thought process? So, uh, you know, one of the things I said is I always enjoyed and went after things where I could learn. And that's uh, sort of what it kept me motivated, gave me the passion to really go after things and really uh, work hard towards it. So, so if there's one thing that I would go after, I would say is uh, go after something that you're passionate about, go after something that you care about, uh, that pushes you to, do, to work a lot harder than you would otherwise, to go beyond what you would do typically just for standard work. work. Um, and, and yes, there will be, you know, that said, and this is something that I've learned over time, it, there are, you know, when you are passionate about something, there are things that you need to do because you're excited about them. There's, there's a 20%, 30% that is maybe not as exciting as you would like, uh, and that changes over time. But that is still important if you want to have an impact. And that's something that I learned over time and I think is as important as the, the stuff that you're passionate about. So, so, so if you want to have an impact, picking the right area that you will care about, that you can stick with, that you uh, will care about is, is definitely uh, very, very important. So it's all about passion. So what I'm hearing from you is with the passion, you can create uh, amazing opportunities for yourself as well as for the world. You can solve some bigger problems. That, and the second that, thing I hear from you is Rajat, uh, we are all going to live 200 years, so better take care of your body. And AI is there to solve that problem. Uh, we are seeing a lot of help. You know, you could argue that even the body will see lots of improvements. Maybe we'll replace more of our organs. Maybe we'll have exoskeletons. There, there are lots of research in all of these areas, but yes, taking care of your body is a good thing. Uh, you know, more people in, you know, at least developed countries probably get, it gets harder. They live long enough that the body starts to give up really on them. So, so being in a good, good health is good. No, 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 I, I'm amazed, Rajat. I uh, recently moved from Bay Area to Las Vegas. I really love hiking here, and I, you will be surprised. Uh, the group I go with, uh, we call it scrambling, and most of the people in that group, I'll say 50% are about 60. And it's unbelievable. It's the toughest thing I've done in my life. In fact, I did a scrambling yesterday uh, in the night, in the night. So that's for some other day. Uh, so we, uh, so my favorite line, which I tell everyone uh, when people ask me about AI is I say, yes, we are outsourcing the job of thinking to computers. At the same time, we are explorers. All humans are explorers and we are continuously seeking new frontiers. So we will find new frontiers and we'll free ourselves to find those frontiers instead of solving the problem of 
uh, mundane problem which we are dealing with, which is maybe even washing our clothes. I mean, forget about anything else. I mean, that itself is such a mundane task. Why do I need to wash my clothes? I'm still looking for clothes I don't need to wash. So, enough people know what to do with their healthy levels, etc. So that that goes parts of it. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say I mean, it's good to be paranoid as a company, I guess, or, or as people, but at some level, it's not like things are going to change or, and like that. There, there's a lot of stuff that goes in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess uh, yeah, weather plays a very important role in my area because I trade energy and it's so difficult to even tell you what, what the wind speed will be an hour from now. And uh, that is so important to know because then you can predict hurricanes, you can predict tornadoes, you can save so many lives. And uh, weather forecasting is just way, way behind. I guess this could be disrupted by AI. Yeah, by, you could find it's helping. Life, yeah, yeah, it's helping, but it's hard. There's just a lot of other stuff. Right? It's not always predictable, as predictable as you would want it to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people are... But that, cool, I'm sorry. Weather, the, you could just uh, do I that. Make some technological make. issues, Rajat. Uh, so I missed the last segment, uh, but uh, I'm assuming Puneet has covered it. So uh, we are not recording, Rajat, so we can talk a little more freely. So I'd love to know what you're doing, man. What's new? If you have five more minutes. It's still not recording? OK, whatever. It's oh, no, same, I'm going to stop it. I'm not recording. I'll <laughs> stop it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We'll cut it out. That, that's OK. No, no worries. I am I, uh, working on the data analytics. Thing.